Another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And here today we have a specimen that many of you may have not encountered ever in your entire life as a surgical pathologist because this is a cryobiopsy. What's a cryobiopsy, Kevin? It looks like a little surgical biopsy to me. It certainly is no transbronchial biopsy I've ever seen and they do the cryobiopsy through the bronchoscope. Exactly. So this marker right here is one millimeter. So you can imagine that we're dealing with a fairly large biopsy. So how do they take these? They put a freezing probe in? They put in a freezing probe through the transbronchial uh, trans, uh, uh, scope and they advance the probe out to the pleura, come back about a centimeter, and then they press the pedal on for six seconds. You're supposed to wait six seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then what happens? Yank it. <laughs> wait, wait, yank what? The probe? <laughs> yeah, yank the probe. So, I mean, and what else? To scare the heck of it, it's going to bleed. Okay. You, know, you yank the probe and the whole bronchoscope because the probe has this big ball of frozen tissue on the end now, so it can't come out through the bronchoscope. So you yank the entire thing out and you just tore a giant hole in the patient's lung. <laughs> and it's bleeding. <laughs> So it's a scary technique for, for, for most uh, practitioners. You know, uh, the, the adage of do no harm sort of becomes uh, center, uh, center place for this. And the cryobiopsy when done well will yield a, a specimen like this. It's eight millimeters, eight, I'm eight, guessing. Here. Eight to 10 millimeters is, the, is a good size for a and transbronchial look, cryobiopsy. And look at the preservation. This biopsy, shows the lung as it was snap frozen perfectly snap frozen in its physiologic state we don't see lung tissue in its physiologic state because surgical wedge biopsies are taken when the lung is collapsed so this biopsy doesn't have a whole lot to my eye at low magnification it looks like there's an artery there that looks a little prominent on this piece yeah here but what about here there's you get this yeah. there's this very subtle change to the interstitial yeah interstitial fibrosis and it's kind of diffuse yeah right yeah so i think you know this is a this kind of borders on a minimal change biopsy but i think i'd probably put it into the category if if this patient comes to me with a history of uh interstitial lung disease query fibrotic lung disease etc maybe hypoxia hypoxia shortness of breath and cough right. <laughs> like right. everybody right uh, I'd, I'd probably put this in the fibrotic NSIP category, right? Certainly not UIP. Right. It's not consolidated fibrosis, but there seems to be an irregular thickening of the interstitium. And I get a sense out there under the pleura, there might, or not the pleura, maybe? Is that the pleura? Yeah, I don't think that's a, that's an artery. That's an artery, yeah. There's some spaces here, but I think they're, they're not cysts. So we've got irregular NSIP-like interstitial scarring. So fortunately, these biopsies are big enough that we can see that this pattern of interstitial fibrosis is not consistent across the whole biopsy. Right. It is present throughout the whole biopsy, but there are alveolar walls here that are completely normal in between scar, right. which is so weird. It's, it's present throughout the whole biopsy, but it's not diffuse and homogenous. Correct. And I think for a general NSIP category, that's one of the most challenging concepts for, for people to understand is that NSIP, although we describe it as a diffuse homogenous process, when you look at it from low power, it often looks heterogeneous. Yeah, yeah. It's variable in the amount of interstitial inflammatory infiltrate or fibrosis. In general, I like to think of NSIP as having a pervasive influence on the interstitium. And if you only had this piece here, I think you could make that argument. There's something in this interstitium that doesn't belong here, and it's there's it. it's too much of it, and it looks funny. It looks um, it looks almost elastotic in a weird way. It's not. Yeah, it's kind of it's light, right? Like, it's here's collagen, color, right? And so what is this? What is this material? It looks pink and a little waxy. Ah, pink, waxy, and amorphous, perhaps. Yeah, it's a hard one though. This is a this is a really challenging case. Look there, you can see some nodularity of that thickening, of that waxy thickening, and it's, it's around a little artery. It's I around think. a little arterial there, right. or a little artery, and here's some more of it here. 
Wow, that's a clue. That's an important clue. If you miss that, I don't know if you could get to the diagnosis here. Uh, if you don't now focus, now I would go to every artery I can find to see if I can find these little waxy accumulations. There's because another one there. if this is yeah. amyloid, as I think it is, you should be able to see that sort of eccentric nodular deposition around, around the vascular little sure. arteries. So this looks to me morphologically like classic amyloidosis, right? Yeah, hard to Amorphous diagnosis. eosinophilic material has that little bit of a cracked appearance to it. Right. Uh, but oftentimes I think about amyloid, I think about nodular pulmonary amyloidosis, but this is diffuse septal interstitial amyloidosis with some accentuation around the vessels. Right. So do we just sign this out? Well, we need to get a stain because I don't think the clinician's been thinking about amyloid when they sent this biopsy. So no. when your clinician is not on the same page as you are, it's very important to look for other um, supportive evidence to yep. strengthen your morphologic impression. Not that your morphologic impression isn't fantastic, but remember, if it's just your, your, your sort of my gut feeling that this patient has amyloid based on the morphology, it may not be enough to convince your clinicians and then the next thing they're going to do is send the case out because they don't, they don't think that you are capable of proving your point. So I like to get up ahead of this and make sure we get an amyloid stain. What, what would you get here? Congo red stain. Congo. In fact, Congo red stain is definitional right. for amyloidosis. You really can't call amyloidosis unless you have a positive Congo red stain. So what if your Congo red stain is negative here? Well, first you'd have to go back and check with your histology department and make sure that they cut the sections thicker than a normal section. Usually 10 to 15 microns. So these are big sections. This isn't in the two and three micron sections that you ask your histologist, histologist routinely uh, to cut at. So make sure the sections are thicker and turn the lights off in your room. Turn the scope up high. Use your polarizers and take time with it because the amyloid is best seen in a darkened room. Yep, and it can be it can be very subtle. Right. But this case showed nice salmon pink appearance on regular light microscopy on the Congo red stain, and then on polarization microscopy showed apple green birefringence. Nice. Now we typically send all of our cases of amyloidosis for mass spectroscopy, which nowadays is really the gold standard for identifying the type of amyloidosis. Right. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different types of amyloidosis, uh, genetic types. There's uh, AL type, which is associated with uh, mm -hmm. monoclonal gammopathies and lymphoproliferative disease. And then AA types, which are associated with chronic inflammatory states, such as connective tissue disease, et cetera. Right. So it really does help uh, the clinicians in identifying the source of the amyloid if you can get mass spectroscopy, because mass spectroscopy will tell you exactly what the, your composition is. What the composition of these amorphous uh, eosinophilic deposits are. Perfect. So this case was sent. This is a case of AL amyloidosis. It's kappa restricted, uh, but that's just the minutia. Really, this case uh, exemplifies some of the challenges associated with uh, mimics of an NSIP type pattern of right. injury, expansion of the uh, interstitium, and then the recognition of this amorphous eosinophilic material and getting the appropriate workup on, on an amyloid biopsy. Great. Max, what do, what do we want to tell our friends out there? Now, don't forget to like and uh, comment below. Thanks for joining us.